Hi, I'm Dwayne Brown. Tonight on KPBS Evening Edition, two county airport towers have been spared from federal budget cuts. Ramona and Brownfield get a last minute reprieve. We have an update on surveillance video used in a case of alleged abuse by a border patrol agent. I'm Amitha Sharma. Tonight, a look at Nathan Fletcher's political hat trick, changing parties once again. And we'll tell you how social media helped push Disney to change its plan to trademark a Mexican holiday. It's absolutely uh, fantastic. I think it's going to be exciting for our community. It's going to be exciting for North County. And Escondido is the starting point this weekend for a major cycling race covering 750 miles. KPBS Evening Edition starts now. KPBS Evening Edition is made possible by Joan and Irwin Jacobs and by... Hello, good evening. Thanks for joining us. Federal officials have canceled plans to close regional airport towers, including the ones at Brownfield and the Ramona Airport. The closure plan was prompted by federal budget cuts, but last month, you may recall, Congress approved a change, allowing the Federal Aviation Administration to use money from other accounts. Local officials especially protested the plan to close the tower in Ramona. It's an aerial firefighting squad where an aerial fire squad, firefighting squadron pardon me, is based there. County Supervisor Diane Jacob was a strong opponent of the closure. She's calling for a more permanent funding fix. The FAA was targeting towers at smaller airports with fewer takeoffs and landings. KPBS and other media outlets recently filed a motion requesting a copy of a surveillance video used in a case of alleged abuse by a Border Patrol agent. Now a judge has ordered the government to release the video. Fronteras desk reporter Jill Replogel joins us from the uh, News Center. Jill, first uh, give us a little background on this case. Sure. So on July 26, 2011, a Mexican citizen named Adolfo Ceja was detained by Border Patrol while trying to cross into the U.S. illegally. He was taken to the Imperial Beach Border Patrol Station, and while he was being processed, he says, an agent by the name of Luis Fonseca kneed him several times and choked him, causing him to briefly lose consciousness. The U.S. Attorney's Office in San Diego filed charges against the agent for excessive use of force, and a surveillance video of the incident was used as evidence in the case. In fact, we have that video, so let's take a quick look at that. So you can see in a bit here that the agent knees Seha, but it's hard to tell if he actually choked him because the agent's body blocks the camera. Jill, where does the uh, case actually stand right now? A jury acquitted Border Patrol agent Fonseca last month, but now a disciplinary review board of U.S. Customs and Border Protection is examining the evidence to determine whether he violated any agency policies. Our front task reporter, Jill Replogel, you can watch the video on our website as well, kpbs.org. A statewide drive to ban plastic bags from most stores got a boost from the California Grocers Association this week. The 400-member group is backing legislation by State Senator Alex Padilla, saying it provides consistency and predictability for consumers. Senator Padilla was in San Diego today for a visit with the mayor and county officials. He says his proposal would ban plastic bags in grocery stores and pharmacies beginning in 2015 and supersede roughly 70 plastic ban ordinances in cities across the state, encouraging shoppers to bring reusable bags or pay 10 cents a pop for paper. You know, in many ways, this bill is sort of a, an ode to my grandmothers. You know, my parents are from Mexico, and I remember growing up, whether it was visiting grandma or even in our own home, having these reusable bags that we used over and over again, you know, going to the grocery store, going to the convenience store on, on a nearly daily basis. And we've come away from those habits, and, you know, I, I think they, they had a point, and we're trying to work our way back there. I know that people are used to, you know, they're uh, creatures by habit. You know, they're used to one thing, and they don't like a change. But uh, honestly, I think it's a great change. I think we should go to paper, uh, less issues. Um, I think we just need to care a little bit more about it. And, and honestly, I think it's a great move. Solana Beach is the only city in San Diego County to ban plastic bags. 
but some businesses say it's hurting sales. Now the city's former mayor is pushing to get it repealed. Now, Senator Padilla is sponsoring one of two statewide plastic uh, bag bans still making their way through the uh, state legislature. Earlier this week, we told you about former Assemblyman Nathan Fletcher's decision to switch political parties again. Amitha Sharma is in for Peggy Pico tonight with a look at the political shuffle. Former Assemblyman and San Diego mayoral candidate Nathan Fletcher has changed his political affiliation twice in just one year. Last April, while running for mayor, Fletcher jilted the Republican Party to become an independent. And last week, Fletcher announced he's now a Democrat. What's driving the political conversions? For some insight, we turn to Voice of San Diego's Chief Executive Officer, Scott Lewis. Scott, when Nathan Fletcher switched from the Republican Party last year during the San Diego mayoral race yeah. to become an independent, he can condemned both parties. Why does he think the Democratic Party is a good fit now? Well, you know, if you read his manifesto, and that was the only thing he did, he put it on Facebook, this is long thing about why he left or why he uh, wanted to join the party. He said, uh, and he admitted that uh, unlike before where he said he hadn't changed uh, and it was just the parties that had changed, what he said now is, yeah, I did change. And, it, and if you look at it, it's kind of written as though he was coming out. I mean, it has a lot of the same language as somebody who is coming out with other things that they knew about themselves that they were uncomfortable with coming out about. And it was, it was kind of a fascinating thing. And a lot of these things saying, don't worry about it, you know, people advising him to trust him and just to deal with the criticism and all this stuff. It was a fascinating sort of way to try to quell the, the, the concern or the, the criticism that he, was, he knew he was going to get. That he was just being an opportunist and cynical. But what made him change? Was there an epiphany? You know, that is a very, there's, there's not a lot of meat in that part of the discussion. Uh, he says that, you know, he became a father. He, he says he feels like the Republican Party is now the party that uh, only is for people who have already made it, not necessarily the uh, opportunity for people who haven't made it in, in the sense of wealth and opportunity. And uh, he saw, also cited things like uh, immigration and, uh, and equal rights for, uh, for gays and lesbians. So I think that, you know, he's, he's trying to toe that fine line about being just ultra sincere, but also knowing that everyone knows that, that he has left the team. He had two options. He could try to form an independent network of, or party of some kind, or he could join the Democrats. And it's a lot easier to join the Democrats than to build a, a movement that nobody has succeeded in building. Why now? What's the political calculation here? I think it's like, it's like somebody deciding to be a Padres fan when they're having a losing season. It's not that the Democrats are having a losing season, but you want to have the credibility that you weren't just doing it for uh, a specific race or a specific calculation. And he also just, why not? You know, I mean, it, it was a good time to keep himself in the news. He and Carl DeMaio, since they lost the mayor's race, have tried to stay on the radar, and he succeeded. There was a tremendous amount of discussion. We're talking about it. I mean, it was a way to keep himself uh, going and to keep the discussion going. To and, open the way for another political run? Well, yeah, and also it was the day of the big Democrats' uh, party. The, uh, the Democratic Party had a big dinner uh, that he got a standing ovation at. He probably wanted to get that standing ovation. I mean, uh, uh, we'll see what he aims for. There's you know, maybe a congressional seat sometime, uh, uh, Susan Davis, maybe uh, a mayor's race in 2016. I don't know, but it, it was a good time to do it, so it wasn't just part of a race. Obviously, we can never know for sure, but let's speculate for a moment. <laughs> Looking back, a year ago in April, if he had decided to become a Democrat instead of an independent, right. might we have had a different outcome in the San Diego mayoral race? I don't think so. I think that that was a Hail Mary, and he got as far as he could with any kind of Hail Mary uh, that he threw. I think that... Um, you know, they had a strong Democrat. The problem is the primary. Primaries are so powerful because so few people vote that, the, that it's just this, you have to be very loyal to parties. You have to have the grassroots. You have to have the organization and money to pull it off. He couldn't beat Carl DeMaio or Bob Filner, who were vote very partisan, through this third route. So it would have been, it would have been seen as just a, a even more opportunist than it was, I think. How has his switch been received by both the leadership and 
Okay, tell me about the leadership first. Of the Democratic Party? Right. Oh, they love it. They're so excited. They worked on him for, people like Juan Vargas worked on him for months. Okay, but leadership is one thing. Yeah. What about the voters? Might they think, oh wait, this guy's flaky. Two well, switches is, in one year. This is going to be his huge problem going forward in the Democratic Party is he's going to face primaries where he'll have to answer for why was he uh, bros with Newt Greenrich and, uh, and, and Grover Norquist. You know, why was he, why was he so on board with this team and now he's switched and how do we can trust him in the future? So that's his primary challenge going forward and, uh, and he's, and he's just going to have to deal with it if he wants to win. And there is not another switch left for him in the future, is there? <laughs> I mean, he would Who knows? Be I, I don't know. I, he, maybe there's religious switches or something. I don't know. He's, he, look, he, he says that this is this is him being more true and clean and open than he has and and so if he's like people who have gone through experiences like that before maybe he'll thrive and we've got a close with our scott lewis thanks for coming in and talking to us thank you bike racing fans will flock to escondido this weekend for the start of the amgen tour of california about seventy thousand folks are expected to watch the start on sunday it's going to be broadcasted to 200, 216 countries. So we will take that and Escondido will be on the map. And uh, it's a great exposure for our city. The tour covers 750 miles from Escondido all the way up to Santa Rosa in the Bay Area over eight days. Remember that uh, rare bald eagle nest we showed you a while back in Ramona? It has a new occupant tonight. One baby bald eagle. Folks at the Wildlife Research Institute have been observing the nest. They say the chick is about a month old. There was a second egg in the nest but didn't hatch. The eagle chick is expected to stay in the nest for about 10 weeks before it starts flying. More sea lions are back in the wild tonight. This video comes from the National Marine Mammal Center, which says more than 1,300 young sea lions have been stranded in Southern California this year. Federal researchers are trying to figure out why. What happens when a giant entertainment company tries to trademark the name of a popular Mexican holiday? It goes viral on social media and the plan changes, as Amitha Sharma explains. Online outrage forced Disney this week to drop its bid to trademark the phrase Dia de los Muertos. The mega entertainment company had sought exclusive domain to sell merchandise associated with the new Pixar film inspired by the holiday, popular in Mexico and elsewhere in Latin America. But the Mexican-American community wasn't having it, and social media like Twitter and Facebook ensured their voices were heard loud and clear. John Rossman, social media editor for KPBS's Fronteras desk joins me now. John, this is yet again another example of the power of social media. Before we get into that, though, tell me the significance of this holiday for Mexicans and Central Americans. Right. Um, so Dia de los Muertos is celebrated throughout all of Latin America, but it originated in Mexico, and it's a huge national holiday there. Um, and so the holiday is really about you know, celebrating and commemorating those in your family who have passed away. But it's also kind of about reconnecting with them. It's, it's a day where you, you know, some build altars, you bring photos, you make their favorite meal. And it's a day where it's more than just remembering, you're, you're able to kind of connect with someone who's passed away. So it, it's a holiday that's really as you can imagine, extremely important to millions of people. So earlier this month, Disney files to trademark this phrase, Dia de los Muertos. What kind of merchandise did it want to secure this name for? Right, so they filed 10 trademark applications, and it's easier to think of it. They filed, I think, like 19 for uh, the movie Toy Story. So it's the same things. It's like T-shirts, fruit snacks, shoes. Um, they, they were filing these trademarks because that was going to be, you know, the potential titles their film, Dia de los Muertos. And so they wanted to protect their assets um, that kind of fall under the title of that film. So walk me through this story, story John. Um, Disney fills out the trademark application. Who broke the story? So it was the small kind of trade journal that follows Disney. And they kind of, they wrote about them filing these trade applications in, you know, for this upcoming movie that Pixar is making. Uh, one of our reporters, Monica um, Uribe, found it and she she um, kind of brought it up in our morning news meeting, and while she was talking, I looked online and saw that it, you know, kind of hadn't been up yet. So, 
you know, I wrote an article, I kind of did a mad dash because when you're online, everything has kind of a race to be first. And while Monica was also kind of doing reporting and we were working together on it. And so we got it up and then we just kind of pushed it out to social media and then it just started taking life on its own. And, you know, I monitor web traffic, et cetera. And you could just see it just snowballing. And if you followed us on Twitter on that day, you're probably really annoyed because that's all we were talking about because it was just growing exponentially and it was crazy. In fact, we have an example of, of some of the response to Disney's plan. Here it is. And so, so news gets out, as you said, and there is a Mexican woman in Colorado who happens to be a healer. She starts an online petition. What was the response to that petition? It was the same as everything else. You know, it was a petition on change.org, you know, telling Disney to remove this. And I think also just being cognizant of how important this holiday is and, you know, what a big, you know, miss site this was on Disney's part. And, you know, today it has over 21,000 signatures. And, you know, really what that grew to be was just a testament of how outraged people were on the site. And there's also a testament of, you know, kind of how new the new media order where there's this petition and it's kind of a part of this growing outcry and it's you know siphoning that and then it's able to be a vehicle for change. What do you think the lesson is, the social media lesson in all of this? The social media lesson, um, well I, I think there's a couple lessons. First it's just you know it's been it's just reporting that you know the sleeping giant you know the Latino population in America is waking up and they have a huge voice and a lot of people are trying to tap into that so that's you know Fox News Latino, Univision, NBC Latino, PETA Latino. And, you know, it's it's this growing power. And I think maybe Disney, you know, a, a part of them were trying to tap into it, too. They're making this movie that celebrates this huge, important holiday. And so maybe it was just a misstep on their part. But because of social media, it's far more transparent and there's far more outrage. And, you know, hopefully, you know, they learned a lesson. Very quickly, have there been similar efforts by other companies before to, to trademark a, a holiday? Um, you know, I, I think that's kind of a complex question. I, you know, there is one trademark filing under for Dia de los Muertos. It's some um, Houston company that does, you know, kind of theater um, things like that. Um, so, you know, I, I think I think Disney's their real takeaway was that we were just trying to trademark this movie. Let's kind of move on. We weren't trying to trademark a holiday, and you know, individuals on social media um, question that. John Rossman, thank you for coming in today. Thanks, Amita. Adult puppet cabaret challenges our expectations about puppetry from its content to the types of puppets it uses. KPBS arts reporter Beth Accomando explains. Hey, hey, how's it going, San Diego? Ah, I'm Gary. Gary. Gary San Diego, that's my name. Yeah. Okay, Gary San Diego might not be the kind of puppet you'd use for a kid's show, but he's perfect for an adult puppet cabaret. Don't expect a regular puppet show if you're coming to an Animal Cracker conspiracy <laughs> show. You know, we're dragging everything out and the kitchen sink. And a lot of the puppets we're making out of garbage, recycled objects, found objects, vintage um, castaways and things that we've found. Puppeteers Ian Gunn and Bridget Roundtree founded Animal Cracker Conspiracy. They regularly stage what they call adult puppet cabarets that bring artists together for a night of puppetry that tackles mature themes. I and mean, we definitely try and change people's idea about what puppetry is. I think most people assume puppetry is for kids, A, or it has something to do with the Muppets. And we both come from a fine art background, and so it definitely has that element to it also where we're really pushing boundaries in what's expected in puppetry. Another thing that's really interesting to us is that in former Czechoslovakia um, they had groups of puppeteers that would bring the news to the underground to the suppressed people during Nazi occupation and the shows were called daisies mm -hmm. and um, eventually many of the puppeteers were caught and killed by the Nazis. So puppetry also has this like subversive element to maybe poke fun at the, the powers that be or to get out the, the word of the street. So puppets have kind of historically been for the people and by the people, which is always something that we really love. Adult puppet cabaret is just one way of spreading that love. I'm just hanging out. I'm a regular here at the, uh, 
what the puppet camera is. I have one initial question, and that is, will you please raise your hand if this is your first adult puppet cabaret? Just raise your hand. Earlier this year, Roundtree and Gunn staged an adult puppet cabaret for a packed house at the Museum of Photographic Arts. This month, they moved to a new venue, an outdoor stage at Space for Art in San Diego's East Village. But you can expect many of the same things, like a puppet making station. So for the sock puppet, you take a sock for the base, and then you take usually kind of a longer fur. You can make hair with it, mustache, um, you can do like a scarf, and then you take the googly eyes, or you can use buttons, or these little pom-poms as eyes, as a nose, and then you can also use this kind of fabric as the tongue. And then you'll have a sock puppet. Gun is big on using recycled objects for puppets. Shopping bag cut into little strips. You can see his elbow there. Oh, you're looking at my elbow. And cardboard, rolled up newspaper, and masking tape that then has been painted with acrylic. Gun and Roundtree will be performing at the next adult puppet cabaret and trying once again to broaden people's perspectives about what puppetry is. It's anything that can be moved by a manipulator, an actor to communicate an idea, a message. If you can use it and you can tell a message and it's something outside of your body, then you're entering that kind of fabulous um, gray area that, that modern or contemporary puppetry is, is exploring right now. And there is a bit of a renaissance on, so there's mm -hmm. people doing all sorts of things. And to me, it's taking the material um, which is an object and animating that. So animus to give something life. So we realize that we're swimming upstream a little bit by working in this medium, uh, but we love it because it does mix so many different things. So I think people will love it and be surprised. If you'd like to be a co-conspirator, just head out for the next adult puppet cabaret and join the Animal Cracker Conspiracy. Beth Accomando, KPBS News. Adult Puppet Cabaret takes place next Friday at Space for Art in San Diego's East Village downtown. I'm Jeffrey Brown. On the next news hour, turmoil in Pakistan as a critical election approaches. Plus, Mark Shields and Michael Gerson. It's Friday on the PBS News Hour. Looks like a bit of a warm up for the weekend. 70s along the coast, partly cloudy. Inland temperatures in the 80s with a mix of sun and clouds, sunny in the mountains, and temperatures in the triple digits for the desert. Aspiring actors, listen up. There's a casting call tomorrow for the sequel to Anchorman, the comedy where Will Ferrell told San Diego to stay classy. Casting directors are looking for as many as 300 people. They'll be at the Double Tree in Mission Valley from noon to 4 tomorrow. If you're thinking about going, they say, to bring some paperwork, a few pictures, and a friendly smile. The Gator by the Bay Festival celebrates Zydeco, blues and bayou music, not to mention lots of food. One San Diego band performing this weekend is Billy Lee and the Swamp Critters. They dropped by our studios earlier this week and performed on KPBS Midday Edition. She got a hold, hold, hold on me. Crazy. 
not the loving kind. I know that I love her. I know love is high. I went to the preacher. I went to the booty creek. Everybody telling me you're in trouble. Deep, 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 deep. That was Billy Lee and the Swamp Critters performing in uh, our studios here. They are performing this weekend at the Gator by the Bay Festival. And you can find tonight's stories and download the KPBS app all on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thanks for joining us. Have a great weekend.